get quite a few comments at, comments of, oh, it's just two farmers playing with a Lancaster at an airfield at East Kirkby. If that's playing with a Lancaster, yeah, that's not going too bad, is it? Okay, so we, we come to 2009. So we've got the, the Lancaster, she's together, she's working. You can get her to the stage where she's doing a tailed up taxi run. So everybody's now asking, when are you going to get a flying? Are you going to get a flying? Um, so just to let you know who's on this photo, we've got Pat Ellis, who's a ground crew member. There's Louise Bush, there's Fred, there's Ian Hickling, Mike Chatterton, myself, Roy Jarman. So 2009, Fred was invited to go on BBC Radio Lincolnshire and have an interview and a talk about the Lancaster and the site here, um, have a recap on what we're doing. Um, and unbeknown to the rest of us, he decided he was going to tell everyone that we're going to get it flying. Um, so we all listened. Uh, we all heard it. I'm sure it happened. We all heard it. Um, uh, so from 2009, it was public that that's what we were going to do. We we're going to get the aircraft airworthy. Um, so from 2009 to 2014, um, we were working on background work what's the first thing you want to get if you're going to get the aircraft flying? And we decided the best thing to do, the first thing to do, is to make sure we've got the engines. So we put in an order for four airworthy engines with Morris Hammond at iTech Engineering. Um, and over a period of five years, I think it was, he overhauled four engines for us. Uh, we bought two originally from Morris to be overhauled. We bought one from Carolyn Grace, who has a two-seat Spitfire. And one of them was one of ours from here at East Kirkby. It was originally the number four that was fitted. Um, so we sent those away, obviously we had them overhauled, um, they're now in, uh, in stores, in the, the bonded store, in a uh, temperature and humidity controlled environment, all inhibited, ready to go. Um, so after we got the engine sorted, we thought they're kind of, they're money in the bank, £125,000 each, you're not going to lose any money on them. Um, so half a million pounds for, for all four engines. Uh, the next step was the logistics around getting her airworthy, what do we need to do in order to facilitate this work happening? So we worked for several years making sure we had sufficient drawings, we had sufficient knowledge about the aircraft um, and about Lancasters in general and how they should be overhauled. One of the things we managed to do was to uh, receive all of the main spar jigs from the RAF um, when they changed the spar on PA474, the rear bottom boom they changed. Um, all of the spar drawings and measurements were made from our Lancaster ready for making the jig. So we knew that that main spar jig would fit our Lancaster. So we thought, before they disposed of it, best thing to do is to offer to, to look after it for them um, so we could use it in the future if we needed to. Um, and we brought that here, um, must have been about 2006, 2007. Um, and we've really been working, buying up spares and parts in the meantime ever since. Um, one of the things we did was uh, I flew out with Ian to Canada. We went to Alberta in Canada to Nampton. Um, and we brought back um, about three and a half engines worth of engine bearers and about four aircraft's worth of undercarriage um, for those to be overhauled and give us serviceable spares um, in bondage store ready for the day when we fly here. Uh, we also bought up uh, nine propeller blades from Tampa Bay, Florida. Um, how they came to be out there I don't really know, but we bought nine uh, Lancaster blades uh, to give us a uh, new old stock of those. Um, so they're never used. They're in fact the same blade as on a particular mark of Corsair, um, believe it or not. Uh, they're also the same blade as fitted to the Mosquito. Um, so those are in stores, ready, waiting to go. Uh, we've bought brand new tyres from Dunlop. Um, they still make the tyres. They're the largest aircraft tyre in production still. Um, so we've been working towards that day when we uh, push the button and actually start the restoration work on the aircraft. Um, Fred, of course, alluded to that slightly earlier than we were perhaps expecting. Okay, so what's the first thing you need to do if you're going to start to restore the aircraft? And the first thing is to assess the aircraft, to survey the Lancaster. So, it's quite a, a long story, this one, uh, but we got some quotes for paint stripping the aircraft and repainting her, so it would give us a chance to actually survey the aircraft, the skins, all the rivets and things like that. Uh, we got a quote and it was coming in at £125,000 to paint, strip and repaint the aircraft. 
we were quite fortunate in the fact that we have um, a gold member of the centre called Armand Lloyd. Um, Armand Lloyd uh, works on a business down in London, but he's uh, also interested, obviously, in, in Lancasters, and he wanted to try and help us in any way he can. He saw on eBay there was a, a large box of um, gauges and instruments for a Lancaster that were up for sale. He contacted and said, do you want me to buy them for you? Are they any good to you? To which we said, yeah, by all means, please do. So he bought them. They're actually um, over in Ireland. He bought them um, and had them posted. And that caused him quite a lot of issues because uh, gauges and instruments are radioluminescent. So they've got a, a radioactive paint. So, of course, all the alarms went off when they came through the postal system. <laughs> the box had to be completely taken apart, everything wrapped in lead, reboxed, and sent back. Um, so, eventually, they were delivered here to East Kirkby. Um, and through all the conversations that Armin had with the seller of these um, items, um, the seller asked him, what on earth do you want them for? What are you going to do with them? To which Armin told him, of course, they were coming here to the Lancaster here at East Kirkby. And it, it turned out that the person who was selling them, his father flew uh, Lancaster's, I think it was 518 Squadron, um, during the Second World War. Um, he was an Irishman, um, and it turns out, as coincidence have it, that he ran a, a huge uh, aircraft painting company uh, called Mass Aviation, MAAS, based out in Holland, in uh, Alabama, in America, and uh, in Ireland as well. Um, and, and this gentleman called Tim uh, said, is there anything I can do to help? Is there anything I can do? And uh, we said, well, as coincidence has it, we've just had a quote for repainting a Lancaster. How do you fancy doing it? Um, so he says, yeah, I'll, we'll uh, organize to come and paint strip and repaint your Lancaster for as cheap as we possibly can. Um, so in the winter of uh, 2016, it took, it took about two years to, to arrange actually how we're going to do it uh, and facilitate in doing it. Uh, the winter of 2016, uh, they sent a, a team of eight uh, gentlemen, all of different nationalities, Polish, Irish, British, Lithuanian, all sorts of uh, different nationalities, uh, brought them over from Holland uh, with all the associated gubbins that they required to paint strip the Lancaster. We got a couple of uh, different sponsors on board. Um, one of them was Axo Nobel for the paint, and another one was a, a scaffolding company to scaffold it all around the aircraft, ready for paint stripping her. Unfortunately, the scaffolding company pulled out the week before, so it left us a little bit high and dry uh, with absolutely no means of getting up to the aircraft to paint stripper. So we eventually managed to hire in um, a load of safety razors, electric uh, scissor lifts, uh, to enable us to do the work. So on these photos here, you'll see the aircraft being completely paint stripped with a chemical stripper um, all the way down to bare aluminium. We found that there were about four or five layers of paint um, on the black and camouflage and about eight to 10 layers on the roundels. So you can imagine I know some fairly good foreign swear words now. Um, the, uh, the aircraft was completely paint stripped down and when the Lancaster was brought here to East Kirkby, it had the squadron codes of YFC, which was the station flight at RAF Scampton. Um, and we never paint stripped the aircraft before uh, this position we're talking here. So it always been painted over the top of. Um, so when we put the DXC onto the aircraft, we just painted over the YFC. And when we then moved on to the DXF and the LEH, we just painted over again. So there's uh, lots of layers of paint on there. I suspect if you were at RAF Scampton um, and you were in Jankers or you'd done something wrong as a, an RAF serviceman, the, uh, the punishment was to go and paint the roundel on the Lancaster. And I think by the judgment of how much paint was on there, there was a lot of dodgy airmen at Scampton at the time um, because uh, there was uh, an awful lot of work to try and get the paint off those roundels. So they eventually got to it, got um, all the paint off. Uh, we allowed originally two weeks to take the aircraft apart before the paint strip. Uh, the plan was to take the turrets off, take the bomb doors off, um, the undercarriage doors, uh, the elevators, the rudders, not, not the rudders, sorry, the elevators, yeah, the rudders, the turrets, everything was to come off to leave a bare aircraft so that items could be paint stripped on the floor and the aircraft could be paint stripped in situ. Um, we allowed two weeks for that. It actually only took us about a week, so we were a week ahead of schedule. Um, they came in, paint stripped the aircraft, and it took them 12 days to paint strip the aircraft, so they allowed a week. So we lost that week straight away that we'd originally gained. Um, the chemical paint stripper was, shall we say, it was good for the first coat, no good for the second coat, but very good on the third coat. So uh, they had a lot of problems actually applying the stripper to get the paint off. Um, it's sprayed on, you allow it to work, it effectively lifts a layer of paint and then you scrape it off. So it's a very manual, uh, labour-intensive job. I said they sent eight men and it took 12 days. 
So once the aircraft was completely paint stripped, it's then washed off with uh, a soapy fluid, a soapy water-based liquid, which actually um, takes the acidity out of the paint stripper and neutralizes it. Um, so it's all washed down, and then from that point, we've got the aircraft back uh, to survey her and to work on her to do the work that we, we thought would be required. So this is the aircraft in a, a clean down state. Um, one of the main jobs we had, we found quite a lot of surface corrosion on her. Um, and that had to be removed using uh, little rubber wheels with little rubber fingers on it. And that just agitates the surface and removes the surface corrosion. So we had the entire Lancaster to, uh, to run over with that uh, to clean any surface corrosion off. Where we actually found to be the, the worst area was underneath the wings and on top of the wings where the original black paint had been when the aircraft was painted white. So we don't know whether that black paint has attracted moisture and knocked moisture in and caused corrosion, or if it's something to do with the, uh, the exhaust gases where they go over and under the wings, which has affected the, uh, the aluminium. So there's quite a lot of uh, work removing corrosion there. Uh, many, many man hours uh, to actually do that. One of the main jobs we wanted to do while the aircraft was in this state, other than the survey, was to replace a lot of anchor nut strip. So there's a lot of panels on the aircraft which are held on by steel anchor nuts and also by rows of rivets. Um, and something that's called up in the modern paperwork for looking after a Lancaster is to remove a set of panels that hold the trailing edge to the wing. And those originally were all held on by rivets. Um, so in order to facilitate these panels coming on, on and off very regularly, um, we would have to replace all those rivets with screws using anchor nuts. Um, so those anchor nut strips had to be specially produced they cost £12,000 for the anchor nut strip, um, and they took a lot of that winter period actually putting those anchor nut strips in. So that's just one piece of work that no one will ever see again. Um, we know it's happened, uh, and we've certainly paid for it. Um, and so that's a survey of the aircraft and some airframe work replacing skins that were, were too badly corroded um, was the majority of what happened during that winter period. A few uh, figures here. So during the, the paint strip and repaint, we used 2,000 meters of polythene, 100 rolls of masking tape, 1,020 liters of paint stripper. Uh, and then for the, the repaint, there was 80 liters of primer, 60 liters of black paint, 20 liters of green paint, and uh, 20 liters of dark earth. There were 640 man hours of corrosion removal. And uh, down the bottom here, you see this is what they're doing. This is Liz, this is Gary. And they've got these uh, little wheels on the end of, of windies, of um, polishing guns, uh, just agitating the skin, removing any corrosion until you get down to the good material underneath. Uh, there were 1,680 man hours to strip, clean, and repaint. It took 12 days to paint strip, and we used 200 of those corrosion removal discs and a lot of uh, elbow grease. So one of the, the problems we had, this is um, some paint here that was used on the aircraft. Um, the paint sponsor was Axo Nobel, as I said earlier. Um, we told them the square area of the aircraft um, and they worked out how much paint we would need. Unfortunately, there were only about 25% of what we needed. So when the aircraft turned up with, um, with eight men willing to, uh, to put the, uh, the paint on the aircraft, we were, were slightly short. Um, so here we are with uh, a huge tent that they put up around the top of the aircraft uh, to enable us to repaint her in. That tent there is inflated. Um, if you turned the heaters off, all the polythene sunk to the bottom. So it's the, the hot air in there, a bit like a hot air balloon, which is actually creating the, the tent structure. So the, the paint team turned up, they opened the primer, started uh, applying the primer. You see this is all the yellow primer on the aircraft and that went perfectly. They, they were just slightly short, but they had some in stock, so they brought it and they finished the priming of the aircraft. When it came to actually opening up uh, the paint that was supplied, as I say, there was only about a, a quarter of what we needed, and it was also matte, uh, and matte paint was no good for the application that we needed. We wanted it uh, about 20% satin rather than black, so it's a lot harder wearing. Um, it also doesn't scuff and, and damage um, quite as, as easily as matte paint. So that causes a huge problem because we were at the end of our winter period basically the last thing to do was to paint the aircraft um, and then you could engine test her, uh, roll her out for taxi runs. Um, so with the, the lack of paint, bearing in mind there's a six week lead time on order of aircraft paint, um, we contacted the, uh, the company that originally supplied it and they couldn't make it for at least six weeks. It was probably going to be closer to ten. 
um, which would have meant that we would have lost about three weeks of the first taxi runs of the season. So we, it's a no-go for us, we couldn't do it. We approached another company, um, who were a paint company, do paint for aircraft, and again, they were going to be a six-week lead time, but they might be able to get us some matte paint a little bit quicker if we wanted any of that. So um, we had quite a few calls between us, conference calls, if I was at home and got a call or anything like that, uh, talking between us all, deciding actually what was the next process, what were we going to do. Uh, one of the ideas we flirted with was painting her completely white, like she would have been uh, when she was out in the Pacific. Um, we could have painted her in the matte paint and then put a, a, a lacquer over the top, which would have made it a satin sheen. But then we decided actually if we did that and the, the lacquer was scraped off, it would just leave matte paint underneath, so that was no good. Um, eventually, um, it became public that we had this problem with the paint. Um, I spoke to uh, Radio Lincolnshire again, um, and they put out the fact that this had happened, uh, and we only had a, a small percentage of the paint that we required, and the, problem, the, the project was at halt until we could sort it out. Um, and luckily for us, um, Witham Oil and Paint, who's actually a local Lincolnshire company, um, gave me a ring and said, can we do the paint for you? What sort of paint do you need? And so we, we talked through it, we looked at data sheets, um, and we worked it all out, and yeah, they could have the paint made in about three days, and they would deliver it. Um, and that actually happened just prior to Easter. So we had a, a downtime of Easter, um, and then the paint uh, team were going to come back um, the Tuesday after Bank Holiday Monday of Easter and start to paint the aircraft again. So we were very fortunate the paint arrived on Good Friday, all ready for the, the paint team to start again on the Tuesday. So they, they came back from Holland, Denmark, wherever they were, were based, uh, came in, um, cleaned the aircraft down again with a solvent cleaner, um, but scuffed the aircraft down, because once you've applied primer, you've only got a certain number of hours before you then put the top coat on top. If you don't meet that, that bracket of time, then you have to re-scuff the surface to have a good surface that the paint will etch to. Um, so they repainted the aircraft. Um, as I say, took that, that amount of paint. Um, the paint then went home. Uh, and we allowed the paint to dry um, before we started to take down all of the polythene around her and get a good look at uh, what the aircraft was going to look like. And she's here completely painted. You'll see here she's having the, uh, the roundel and the, uh, the letters painted on the side. This is some of the paint team bottom left here. We gave them a free t-shirt, as you do. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that's uh, painting on all the roundels and the... Uh, the artwork and then on the nose we had a, a gentleman called Duncan Parker from Nottingham came and painted the uh, the nose art on for us. Now this nose art is slightly different to what was taken off um, in the fact that we decided we would depict Chris's operations on the nose. So that's all of Chris's operations he did during wartime on, on Halifaxes. So the, the yellow ones are nighttime ops, the um, ice creams there are Italian operations, the FOS sticker is for shooting down enemy aircraft. The red one is for a Berlin operation, and the key is for the 21st operation. Uh, Duncan put his own slant on the, the nose art, the Just Jane. You'll see it looks slightly different to uh, what, what came off. He's had a little bit more depth to it and things, and every artist, of course, has their own take on uh, what they're going to do. So that's how she rolled out in the, the spring of uh, 2017. Um, so the original quote to paint strip and repaint the aircraft from another company was £125,000. Um, using mass aviation, we were en enabled us to, uh, to do it all for £20,000. So uh, an absolute snip of what it was originally going to cost. The benefit, of course, doing all that was we did a survey of the aircraft. We knew what we needed to do to then make her airworthy, or at least the majority of what we needed to do to make her airworthy. From that point, we had to then decide on a plan going forward on how we're going to do it. We had to, of course, speak to the CAA and say, by the way, we want to restore our Lancaster to airworthy condition. What do you think? Um, so we went down for a meeting with the CAA. Um, they were very happy for us to do it, as long as, of course, we followed all the protocol and procedures that were required to, to restore an aircraft, whether it be a Lancaster, a Spitfire, a Hurricane, anything of that sort. What we've come across with the Lancaster is, because it weighs so much, it actually comes into a similar category to a 737, 747 airliner. And what's required of the CAA licensed company here is the same as whether you're restoring um, or working on an airliner. So the way it's worked out is there are different companies within the CAA um, legislation licensing, um, and depending on what aircraft you work on, um, dictates what sort of company you have to set up. Uh, so for a Lancaster, you need an A823 company, so that's for a heavier aircraft. 
and effectively with the approval of the company we could say to them we want to now work on a Boeing 747 not that we get it in here but um, <laughs> we'd need to be able to prove that we could do it effectively but um, it's the same license as required the same company approval that's required for Lancaster as, as something a bit bigger and a bit more uh, modern than, than that so we, uh, we started thinking, how are we going to actually do the work? What's the best thing to start on? What's the, the best part of the aircraft or what needs the work first? Um, so from the survey, we found um, where the wooden parts of the aircraft were. I believe it or not, a Lancaster does have wooden parts, even though it's the size that it is. Um, so the wood on an aircraft that's 70 years old and that's been open to the elements because it's been stood outside the majority of its life tends to deteriorate. Um, and we found that the worst parts of the wood on the aircraft were actually the leading edges of the fin. So, on the, see on the starboard side of the aircraft, the front edge of the tail fin, that's actually got a, a mahogany leading edge, which the, the skins are screwed to. Mahogany is a controlled substance now, so we couldn't use mahogany, so we used ash. Um, so, the, the first thing we thought we would do is we've got to tackle these wooden areas, because if we don't take them apart, they'll find their own way apart in the next few years. Um, so, we thought the first thing to do is tail fins. Okay, so, what's the plan? A Lancaster is a sectional aircraft, so as you can see here, if you can decipher this plan, this is out of the, uh, the AP2062, which is basically the, the Bible on Lancaster, it's the manual for working on Lancaster.